Six churches in the East End of London stand as extraordinary memorials to a troubled architectural genius who emerged from the shadow of his mentor, Sir Christopher Wren. His name was Nicholas Hawksmoor. Hawksmoor was to do with the dark side and accessing the pagan and the Gothic imagination. He was a genius. The man was a genius. He was responsible for some of the most unique and original buildings in England. A lot of strange things have happened around the churches. The Great Fire in 1666 destroyed much of London, but also left a clean slate on which to rebuild. Sir Christopher Wren famously set about the task, and buildings like St Paul's Cathedral stand as testaments to his great achievements. However, Nicholas Hawksmoor, a former pupil of Wren's, was given a free reign to build churches in the east of London. Hawksmoor's churches have gathered a reputation for being at the centre of strange events and mysterious deaths. The city is a castle of a thousand turrets. On its twisting and multitudinous stairways, the slave lines go down three generations in darkness. Nicholas Hawksmoor was the responsible for the design of six churches in London under the 1711 Commission. The first one was St Ulfages in Greenwich to replace a church that had partially collapsed. He then designed churches in the East End, at St George's in the East at Wapping, here St Anne's Limehouse, Christchurch Bittlefields. He designed one church in the City of London, St Mary Woolnoth, and then finally St George's Church in Bloomsbury. Christopher Wren's churches are scattered throughout the old City of London, the heart of London. Hawksmoor's churches were much more odd, grotesque, uncomfortable and therefore they put them outside, they put them in Limehouse, they put them in Greenwich, they put them on the highway, they put them in areas where there would be crime. Hawksmoor threw his net very widely in st his study of the architecture of the ancient world and of course the early Christian churches quite often cannibalized Roman buildings that were pagan in their origins and so Hawksmoor's sort of sources for his architecture are, are very wide and very diverse and he brings them together in an incredible way. I mean, he was a genius. The man was a genius. If anyone was to walk past the Hawksmoor Church and not know what it was, they would be impressed, firstly, by the size and, secondly, by the kind of raw power of them. They're very unornamented, but they're very, very striking in their silhouette and their boldness. Um, and I don't think anyone had, would ever have seen a building quite like an, a Hawksmoor Church. They're supposed to look like ancient pagan temples that have kind of been adapted to become Christian churches. Temples of a religion for which there is no religion. The buildings were stronger than the religion they represented. The six churches are striking buildings. Their unique presence encouraged the author Ian Sinclair to put together the pieces of a supernatural puzzle over 25 years ago in his book Lud Heat. Sinclair decided that the churches have mysterious events associated with them and they are arranged in a pattern that has influenced their surroundings in a sinister manner, what he calls psychogeography. I wrote this book, Lud Heath, back in 1974, which was a sort of series of fairly wild speculations in terms of the the church is being linked by ley lines or lines of power that from one church you could see to another church and so the churches then become generators of energy and if these are energy beacons then they light up the city and if you use that that is then a grid that could be called psychogeographic because it is like a psychological reading of the city they are, they are powerful places, they are powerful buildings the, the reason why so much energy went into creating them, looking at thinking how they should be built, is precisely to have that effect. These are the acupuncture points. The churches become the needles driven into the skin of the city. The structures are so inexplicable, so extraordinary and dynamic, that it leads you to imagine that something beyond the rational occurred in association with those buildings. Other writers have been drawn to London's enigmatic architect. In his novel, Hawksmoor, Peter Ackroyd cast him as a villain. Peter Ackroyd, when he wrote his novel Hawksmoor, took the whole thing one stage further and suggested that Hawksmoor was actually a believer in a pagan religion which involved sacrificing a child and burying one in the foundation of each of the churches. What you've really got to remember about these churches, the most important thing, perhaps, is, is the age in which they were built. This was an age that had seen some absolutely massive cataclysms hit London.
First of all, you'd had the civil war, you'd had the execution of one king, you'd had huge religious change and upheaval, terrible plague. You then had the city burning down, there were hurricanes, the river froze over, there was a total eclipse in 1715, plunging everyone into complete darkness. And so the background behind these churches is a period of fear, of superstition, of nervousness about what the world held in store. Have given off a dynamic that's so fierce, so ferocious, that it seems to encourage most extreme forms of crime or sacrifice. These extremes of crime and sacrifice have manifested themselves in a number of gruesome ways, not just in Victorian fantasy, but also in bloody reality. Over the years, St Anne's Limehouse and its surrounding area has fired the imaginations of the city's greatest literary figures. This church feels like it belongs in a city of the dead. It's the area of the the opium smoking of the Victorian imagination, Sherlock Holmes, Jekyll and Hyde, all those things fit into this kind of area. St George's in the East has more tangible and dreadful links with the macabre. The Radcliffe Highway murders, two bloody massacres that terrified the nation in 1811, both happened within the vicinity of this church. And outside its gates, a shocked community gathered to commemorate the murders with a bizarre and some say occult ritual. The Ratcliffe Highway murders that Thomas de Quincey wrote about all took place around St. George in the East. And these were ferocious. I mean, somebody broke into a house and mutilated and killed an entire family, including beating a baby's head in with a mallet. The whole area around that church got into a state of mass panic or hysteria about these crimes. The murders shocked the community because they had never seen anything like that. It was something new, uh, mass murder in a sense, you know, multiple or uh, serial murders were virtually unheard of. Twelve days later, uh, another horrific uh, experience took place. This, this time in the King's Arms, in New Gravel Lane, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Williamson, had been murdered. Not only had they been uh, struck about the head, but they had been slashed, their throats had been uh, cut, so much so that the, the, the heads were practically off their bodies. The whole country was in a frenzy. The King himself ordered more guards on duty at the palace. But four days later, with panic at fever pitch, there was an arrest. John Williams, a young sailor, was charged with the murders. There was little evidence, but with emotions in the area running high, police needed to catch someone and catch them fast. Then, in an event never witnessed before or since, the community took justice into its own hands. A man called John Williams was arrested for the murder. He never came to trial because he committed suicide. So a ritual device was enacted whereby this man's body was put on a cart with the murder weapons and paraded through the streets. Williams was brought to this crossroads and, and about where that manhole cover is they dug a pit, they drove a stake through his heart and they cut off the head. Now by rumour the skull was kept in a pub called the Crown and Dolphin. The only remaining memory of this horrific episode in London's history is a gravestone that rests at St George's in the East. It belongs to the first victims of the murderer, the Marr family. This gravestone is one of the most significant finds that uh, we've had in recent history, sacred to the memory of Mr. Timothy Marr, aged 24 years, and also his wife, Mrs. Celia Marr and also their son, Timothy, aged three months. Hawksmoor's church in Bethnal Green, Christchurch, Spitalfields, also has grim connections with death, particularly the plague. Christchurch, Spitalfields would be in an area that was a Roman burial ground and a place of the plague dead. And so, in a sense, they, it is on a reservoir of death. When they emptied the crypt of that church was one of the most extraordinary moments in London's history. Bodies were buried six or eight deep. The heaviest coffins were put on the top, so they pressed down like a wine press and just squeezed the bodies until they became a kind of compacted mess. 
So the church was closed off. It wasn't used for services, but yet forensically, people looking as if they'd come out of the X-Files in masks were laying out the bodies of the dead that went back hundreds of years in the middle of that church. Horror revisited the church in the late 19th century when London's most notorious serial killer struck again and again within the sound of its bells. This building was crucial to the Jack the Ripper murders. All the murders took place in a circle around this building. The final murder of Marie Jeanette Kelly under the car park, just multi-story car park around the corner was the most terrifying of all the murders in which you know the whole body was eviscerated entrails taken out and hung around the room all kinds of horrors the 20th century satanist alistair crowley claimed that christchurch was a magnet for murder the magician alistair crowley wrote an essay in which he suggested that whoever committed these murders arranged the bodies in the five spots around the church to make up a pentacle which would then confer invisibility on the murderer. So if this was the case, then that murderer is forever present and is invisible. The modern era seemed to have laid these horrors to rest, but then in 1974 a murder revived memories of the era of Jack the Ripper. This time it was Hawksmoor's Church St George's in the East that was the focus. Ian Sinclair remembers the incident vividly. Cannon Street Road, looking back down towards these dingy shops. That is where this man called Abraham Cohen, when I was working here, had a tiny little kiosk of a shop selling odds and ends. And one day he's found murdered, his body is on the pavement, and there are coins placed exactly at his feet, as they were with one of the Jack the Ripper murders. And the curious thing is that nothing was stolen, but if you went into the shop behind, Inside old cocoa tins was something like £250,000 rolled up in money. How he got that money, why the money was left behind, why the coins were put at his feet, you know, nobody knows. But yet again, the pattern is there, strange rituals, missing heads, curious coins, and a possible connection to a Hawksmoor church. It happens time and time and time again. For believers in the Hawksmoor legend, the root of the mystery lies in the architect's conception of his churches. The inspiration in their design is otherworldly, derived from ancient, brutal, pagan civilizations. He was obsessed with the wonders of the ancient world. He was obsessed with the seven wonders of the world. And he drew his inspiration from a whole series of buildings he'd never seen before, that he'd read about, which existed in the Middle East, and he drew his inspiration from these, and he put that inspiration into the churches. If you look at St. George's Bloomsbury, sitting on the top of that is a pyramid. Bizarre, weird thing to, to do. Pyramids feature quite strongly in, in what Hawksmoor's doing. In fact, at St. Anne's, they've pyramid which is originally meant to be at the top of the tower has been taken down and is now in the graveyard below. Uh, the, the pyramid sort of relates back to ancient Egypt, of course. That is one strand of it. Then another strand, in more contemporary terms, we can see on the American dollar the pyramid with the eye in the pyramid, which is a Masonic symbol. So it relates straight back to, to Freemasonry. Some take this further, believing that a curse has somehow been transported to the present from the distant past. If Hawksmoor designed these buildings by using plates from libraries that were to do with older buildings,